thank you. Thank you so much for this invitation in, in this university and in this faculty. I was impressed when I heard about the programs and, and the, the uh, teachings that you have here, which I think um, are important, knowing how we are studied abroad and how less we are studying, studying what is happening in uh, many areas around the world. ا تشکر می کنم از تشریف فرمایی همگی و این برنامه که شکل دادم من وقتی وارد دانشگاه شدم و برنامه های دانشکده رو آشنا شدم تحت تاثیر قرار گرفتم اینکه چه موارد اینجا درس داده میشه و چه به چه نحوی خارجی ها و سوژه مطالعه جا مطالعه میشه so the, the topic that was given to me and i think it's an important one for me coming from uh, uh, in fact two different backgrounds First, being a, a, a Sunni a scholar trained in the Sunni tradition, and at the same time living in the West, I'm a Western Muslim by uh, being by definition, and uh, as I'm always saying, I have multiple identities, and we'll see in our discussion today that there are things that are important challenges when it comes to uh, the typology. of uh, uh, trends that we have within our Islamic tradition. موضوعی که قرار من صحبت بکنم با توجه به اینکه تیپولوژی جهان اسلام با باید این رو مد نظر داشت که من از دو تا سابقه برخوردار هستم یکی اینکه اهل سنت هستم و دو اینکه یک مسلمان بربی هستم در غرب زندگی میکنم و همیشه گفتم که یک هویت چندگانه دارم و این هویت چندگانه چالش های مهمی رو شکل میگه که در در ادامه بحث و در مورد تیپولوژی که موضوع مهمی هم هست مطرح خواهد شد. We are in a university and my background is as you know coming from a university I went through the traditional teachings of scholars in Egypt was on a map show you and, and getting the ijazat. I know what it means to get the traditional knowledge I know also what it means to come to something which is essential for me, which is critical thinking. And within the university, there are uh, conditions. And the conditions here is no limits to critical thinking. So we have to be critical from within, critical when it comes to not only the others, because it's very easy to be critical towards the others, it's also to be very critical towards our own tradition in a constructive way. which means not to destroy, but to get a deep understanding of the dynamics that we have within our tradition, and to try to understand in which way, in practical ways, we can come to uh, solutions. So my take here is not to visit a university for the sake of saying, I went to the University of uh, Tehran, is to come to our common responsibilities, me as a thinker or as a, Uh, uh, an island from within the, the Islamic tradition, but at the same time, you as professors, uh, our students, we today are facing important challenges. We are not here to think far from the people. We are here to think for the sake and serving the people. So university serves the city and not the other way around. <coughs> من هم سابقه دانشگاهی دارم و هم سابقه تحصیلات سنتی رو دارم یعنی هم سیستم سنتی آموزش سنتی مصر رو تجربه کردم که اجازات رو میدن مجوز میدن علما بعد از تحصیل و هم میدونم که آموزش سنتی چگونه است هم آموزش آکادمیک و دانشگاهی رو که مبتنی بر تفکر انتقادی است شرط دانشگاه اینطوری که در تفکر انتقادی هیچ محدودیتی وجود نداره و نکته مهم اینه که انتقاد شاید کار ساده‌ای باشه به خصوص اگر در قبال دیگران باشه مهم اینه که علاوه بر انتقاد دیگران تفکر انتقادی نسبت به دیگران نسبت به خودمون و سنت‌های اندیشه‌ای خودمون هم تفکر انتقادی و البته سازنده داشته باشه این هم مستلزم درک عمیق از تفکراتی است که ما داریم لذا این بازدیدی که من امروز اومدم دانشگاه صرفا برای این نیستش که اومده باشم و دانشگاه رو ببینم و مثلا اعضای که افرادی که در دانشگاه هستن رو دیدار داشته باشم یک مسئولیت مشترکی از بین من به عنوان یک عالم اسلامی یک عالم اهل سنت سنت اسلامی و شما که دانشگاهیانی هستین که هر دو با چالش‌های اندیشه‌ای امروز رو در رو هستیم 
و نکته اینجاست که ما باید ممانه دانشگاهیان در خدمت شهر باشیم و ممانه یونیورسیتی در خدمت سیتی و شهروندان باشیم نه متقابلا شهروندان و شهر یا جامعه در خدمت ما باشیم Having said that, and I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying, it's not a, 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 a Western professor coming to Iran and speaking about critical, critical thinking as if there is not a tradition. That's not true. You have a very deep tradition of critical thinking in Iran and in the Shia tradition, which sometimes, and this is what I'm saying as a Sunni, Sunni scholars had to learn more about, because there, are criti there is critical thinking. The point for me is not to come and to patronize and to come to lecture Iranian uh, uh, intellectuals and teachers and professors or even uh, 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 ulama. My point is the deep and the first danger that we are facing is not to think that in order to be critical to have, we have to imitate the West, is in fact to be alienated from our own history and to lose what was part of the Iranian or the Shia tradition. That's the main problem. In fact, responding to the West by repeating the past, not understanding that there is a past of critical thinking coming from the Shia and the Sunni tradition, and in order to respond to the West to become imitator of the past and not creative towards the, the, the future. Um, so, I can, uh, make sure I'm, uh, I get it clear. so we have had the past and we should get back to the past or create a new thing based on the past. Not to imitate the past in order to respond to what we think is the critical thinking coming from the West. I think I'm not talking about anti-Iranian just as somebody who is coming from a Western tradition, this is the way you have to be critical. No, it's just to reconcile Iran or the Iranian tradition or the Islamic tradition with its very meaning. Uh, تفکر انتقادی داشتن و من هم به عنوان یک اهل سنت اینجا و صحبت های زیادی هست که بخوایم بین هم دیگه مطرح بکنیم و به سنت های به سابقه تفکر انتقادی بین خودمون برگردیم نباید از غرب در بحث تفکر انتقادی تقلید بکنیم اتفاقی که افتاده و ما اون سنت ها رو از دست دادیم و فراموش کردیم سنت هایی که در مورد تفکر انتقادی هم تر تفکر شیعی و هم در تفکر اهل سنت وجود داشته. So I have a question to you at the beginning of my, of my talk, which is I'm not going to assess your intellectual contribution by the way you are responding to the West, but I have one question. This is the starting point of the discussion. Are you truly faithful to the Iranian Shia tradition? in what you are producing, or are you only reacting to the West, in what the West is imposing? How much are you faithful to your own tradition? That's the main question for me, that's the main challenge, is in which way we are faithful to a dynamic, to a vivid, to a very creative tradition, not by responding to the West, but by producing from within the thoughts that are uh, necessary today. So I have a question. How much are you faithful to your past? How much are you faithful to your tradition? I don't care about you responding to the West. I care about you being creative from your own roots. Let's have a kalam from this soul of today. I'm glad I'm also the first time. Man, I don't enjoy it. We can say that some of the things that are talos hay and the shayi shom mutalat va faaliyat hay elmi tun be. در قبال قرب چه کارهایی کرده و چه پاسخهایی به قرب داده سوال من اینه که چقدر به سنت شیعی و ایرانی تفکر انتقادی اعتقاد دارید و وفادار موندید یا اینکه صرفا دارید به قرب با خونش نشون میدید این فعالیت های علمی که داره صورت میگیره مبتنی بر اون اندیشه و سوابق تفکر انتقادی شیعی و ایرانی است مبتنی و سنت های خود شماست یا در صرفاً با و حالت انفعالی نسبت به 
روی کرد غربی است Okay, so let me start with the very topic that we have today when it comes to the typology and the diversity that we had within, which is part of our strength. In fact, the strength of the people who are seeing Islam as a threat are being the enemies of anything that could come out of an other civilization, which means the they see the relationship to, and this is, by the way, the essence of what Huntington tried to say, is that in fact the essence of the power struggle is when another civilization can contribute to the universal and the monopoly of what is perceived as the monopoly of universal values, is when you look at the other thinking that the other can produce as good as you are producing. That's the internal thing. So what uh, uh, the power of uh, 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 such a, a, a civilizational uh, debate and power struggle is in fact a very important point is that the strength of the powerful is coming out of the weaknesses of the dominated. And if we don't know how to deal with our power, this will become weaknesses. And this is exactly what we have with our internal diversity. Muslims to do, today don't know how to deal with their diversity. Um, تمدن دیگری نگاه میکنن که این نکته همون نکته ریشه ای در تفکر هانتینگتون هست که تو بحث برخورد تمدن ها چیزی که معتقد اینه که یک تمدن دیگری نسبت به اون چیزی که تمدن غرب تلقی میکنه ایشون نمیتونه مثل این تمدن و به تعبیری حق نداره مثل این تمدن بخواد تولید بکنه شرایطی ایجاد بکنه تفکری رو ایجاد بکنه و نباید مثل من بتونه باشه در واقع تو این بحث تمدنی تو این مناقشه تمدنی و مباحثه نکته مهمی هست که قدرت قدرتمند کسی که قدرتمند هست قدرتش رو از ضعف کسانی که تحت تاثیر و تحت ضعیف هستند گرفتن و اگر ما بدونیم به عنوان تمدن اسلامی به عنوان جامعه اسلامی بدونیم که چطور از این تنوع جامعه همون که بچه قدرت ما استفاده بکنیم میتونیم قدرتمند باشیم و در غیر این صورت اگر ندونیم که الان اینطور هست که نمیتونیم از این تنوع به عنوان یک وجه ممیزه و یک وجه قدرت استفاده بکنیم پس تبدیل به ضعف ما خواهد شد So just to make it clear liabilities or powers that are not managed properly or mismanaged could be weaknesses and this is where counter power or people who want to deal with a specific civilization are using this mismanaged powers to transform this, this into weaknesses. My main concern now is not how the West or how other powers are dealing with our uh, weaknesses, is how we from within are making the power being a weakness, making the reality of an accepted diversity starting from the very beginning of Islam as something which is not Uh, celebrated diversity but complain about divisions with it. So how we go from accepted diversity to divisions and how today we go from divisions to an accepted diversity. It creates and what we need today is a psychological revolution. It's an intellectual revolution to come and to be serious about the fact that diversity is not only the essence of Islam that it's an imperative for us to come back to our strength in the future. Thank you, Shah Pokhtar Bukhan. In has ke masuliyat qudrat vakti modiriyat nashode bashe ya suye modiriyat shode bashe tabdil be zaf mishe. Az in pas mukhalifin va doshmanan az in suye modiriyat bahre vardari mikonan, suye istifade mikonan va hamun ro tabdil mikonan be zaf ma. Va وقتی ما نمیتونیم از این از این تنوع و از این وجه 
تمایز به عنوان یک قدرت استفاده بکنیم و به صورت صحیح مدیریت بکنیم پس میشه ابزاری برای استفاده اونها واقعیت اینه که این تنوع اسلامی از شرایطی که امر پذیرفته شده بود تبدیل شده به یک تقابل یک زمانی در صدر اسلام این تنوع پذیرفته شده بود اما الان به یک تقابل تبدیل شده پس به یک انقلاب روانشناختی به یک انقلاب اندیشه نیاز داریم تا این تنوع که اساس و پایه اسلام هست به قدرت ما تبدیل شناخته بشه و به قدرت ما تبدیل بشه برای آینده so. I should be clear here. Uh, to sit down in a room and say, oh, these are nice words, it's about unity and we have to go towards dialogue, that's fine. But it's not enough. What I'm saying here takes effort. It takes intellectual courage. It takes some time that you have to pay the price. The fact, for example, that uh, for eight years I have been involved in Press TV, which is an Iranian uh, 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 TV channel, and dealing with Shia and saying, I'm doing it because I think that this is a principle of this diversity and the, 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 the dialogue that we need to have between Sunni, and being perceived as by some Sunni brothers and sisters, I betraying my own tradition, saying, no, I'm not betraying. That's exactly it. This is my tradition. But at the same time, going and being uh, uh, dealing with Akra, which is in fact based in Egypt, a Saudi channel, and being free there and having a program and saying, I'm doing it even though I'm critical towards, I'm in fact, just to tell you the truth, I'm critical towards all the governments in, on earth, not only the United States. I could be critical towards Saudi Arabia, towards Iran, towards Egypt, towards, I don't care. I'm critical with what should be right and resisting what should be wrong and what is wrong. This is coming from the Quran, and Amr al Ma'roof, and Nahi al Munkar. No one has the full truth. No government is doing everything well. So you have, this is your stand. You pay the price for this. You have to pay the price. You have sometimes to acknowledge the fact that, for example, I cannot go to uh, Saudi Arabia. I cannot go to many Muslim majority countries. I was banned from the United States of America. Very proud of this, but be clear. If you are intellectuals, if you are professors, if you are people who are working for unity, you have to pay the price. It's not to sit down and say, you know what, I'm open-minded. But open-minded and passive are two contradictory terms. I want to that that not جرأت داشت برای اندیشه های جدید باید بهای این تفکر متفاوت رو داد من هشت تا تو پرسیدی که خب به حال متعلق به ایران شیعی است که کار کردم و برنامه داشتم و بعضی ها متفکر کردن که من دارم به اهل سنت و تفکر اهل سنت خیانت می کنم که با شیعیان دارم کار می کنم در حالی که این دقیقا اصول گفتگو و تفکر اهل سنته که باید دیالوگ داشت باید تعامل داشت با هم دیگه و تو شبکه های دیگه هم رفتم و فقط شبکه پرست هم بوده شبکه های اهلی سنت هم رفتم یا ممکنه باز هم برم این نکته هم باید تحکیل کنم که من همه دولت رو نرم کنم روزو ما فقط آمریکا مورد نرد من نیست هر دولتی رو من نرد میکنم چون که تصریح قرآنه که امر به معروف و نحی از منکر باید داشته باشیم و هیچ کس کامل نیست هر دولتی که روی زمین وجود داره به هر حال نقاط ضعف و قوتی داره و من به عنوان یک آدم اندیشمند موظفم که نقد بکنم تا اشکالات رو بگم و این بهای این نقد ها رو هم دارم میدم اگر من در عربستان یا بعضی کشورهای دیگه یا در آمریکا راه نمیدم و مایه افتخار من هست که آمریکا به من اجازه ورود نمیده به هر حال اینا بهای این تلاش و این فعالیت هایی است که من به عنوان یک عالم اندیشمند اسلامی so I don't know if I said all that, but I just want to thank him for the translation uh, at the beginning, but sometimes I'm, I'm forgetting at the end to, to thank you. So thank you for the work that you are doing. And it's not always easy to follow. Anyway, you don't have to translate that. So, uh, uh, <laughs> most of the people here know English. Okay. I'm so this is why they are laughing. Make sure for some of them. Okay. So uh, the first point which is important when it comes to unity and diversity in Islam is that we have to acknowledge, and this is a position of principle, and it's an easy one, but it ha it's a demanding one, which means we are talking about unity in Islam, 
And we are saying in the man mu'minu ikhwa that we are all brothers and sisters in Islam and that we have to acknowledge that there is something which is umma wahida, that we are part of one spiritual community. And I said spiritual community, be careful. Within the spiritual community, there are cultures, civilizations, and traditions that the spiritual community is. When I come to my uh, Shia brothers and sisters in Islam, we have this spiritual community. I can feel it and this is part of we are brothers and sisters in Islam, meaning the spiritual community beyond all the national bonds. So this is, there is something here that we call uh, unity. But within this unity, there is a di an accepted diversity. I will come to this because there are levels of diversity that are very important. They are not all at the same level. We have to differentiate between uh, uh, the legal, between the philosophical, between the cultural, and even between the political, because even in our political stances, we have differences. We, do, we might be brothers and sisters in Islam, but we don't have the same political priorities. And then we have to understand that uh, this political diversity should not undermine the spiritual unity. And our spiritual unity should help us to deal with all the other diversities. So, I'm your brother in Islam, whatever is my tradition, and this brotherhood, sisterhood, should be important in our spiritual unity, accepting diversity. But what it means, and I will end with the first condition, that we need to acknowledge something. So if there is an accepted diversity, there should be freedom to think. No diversity without freedom. I should be free to think. I should be free to ask questions. I should be free to have <coughs> my positioning. So to say unity and diversity between the two, there is a space for freedom. If not, we are confusing unity with uniformity. We all think the same, and that's not going to happen. Never. There was never uniformity, even with the Prophet Never. The people who are belong, uh, 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 around him, the companions, were having a uniform thought. Never. It never happened. And he accepted the diversity of thoughts from the people around him. So the unity when it comes to faith means freedom when it comes to thinking. That's part of our tradition. And we have to be quite clear about this because an accepted diversity has to do with... Uh, an accepted freedom of thinking. Um, in the case of the Rasmiyat, we have to say that the Ummah of the Ummah is a very important thing. The Ummah is a very important thing. The Ummah is a very important thing. فارغ از فرهنگ و تمدن و سنت و اینها و ملیت زیل این جامعه معنوی قرار داریم به عنوان مسلمانان که خواهر و برادر همدینی همدیگه هستیم و تحکید هم که این رو باید جامعه معنوی دونست که شمولیت داشته باشه به همه اینها برای وقتت ما یک تنوع مقبول نیاز داریم یک تنوع تذیرفته شده نیاز داریم و برای این مهم هست که زیل این وقتت ما تفاوت رو قائل بشیم به حال سوتای مختلف وجود داره بین بحث فلسفی، سیاسی و اندیشه ای اختلاف هست و باید پذیرفت اینها سوتای مختلفی دارن و اولویت بندی کرد اما نکته مهم اینه که نباید جامعه معنوی تحت تاثیر این تفاوت ها قرار بگیر جامعه معنوی اولویت داره به همه اینها و من و شما میتونیم برادر و خواهر هم دیگه باشیم از هر سنت و تفکری که باشیم ولی این برادری مهمه این اختلاف های ما در مرحله دوم هست و اولویت با این هستش که ما زیر جامعه معنوی همه با هم دیگه تعریف میشیم اگر این تنوع پذیرفته بشه باید آزادی اندیشه رو هم پذیرفت باید آزادی پرسشگری رو هم پذیرفت در واقع بین وحدت و تنوع یک آزادی هست آزادی اندیشه و آزادی تفکر وجود داره که اگر این رو قائل بهش نباشیم منجر به هم سانی هم شکلی افراد خواهد شد که چیزی که پذیرفته نیست و مطابق نگاه اسلامی نیست که همه مثل همدیگه و کاملا منطبق و شکل همدیگه بخوان فکر کنن رفتار کنن و یونیفرم و یک شکل باشن حتی زمان پیامبر هم اصحاب پیامبر از همه یک تیپ و یک تفکر نبودن شخصیت ها و تیپ های فکری متفاوتی داشتن و این بخشی از سنت ماست که این تنوع 
مستلزم این آزادی اندیشه بین مردم هستش Having said that, get me right in what I'm trying to say at the beginning of our understanding that there is an accepted diversity and uh, unity doesn't mean uniformity and no uniformity means space for freedom. What I'm pray, trying to, to share with you is something which is deep. Before even you start thinking is a mindset. It's a mindset. The mindset is nurtured by the spiritual understanding that yes, there is one God La ilaha illahu. We are connected to him. We are trying our best to come close to him. But we should get it right before even we start thinking that the way we think will never capture the only one truth that is coming from him. So the mindset is not only psychological. It's uh, deeply spiritual that you can be connected to God with your heart. We don't, you don't ever, never capture the essence of truth, you alone. It's not going to happen. So this is the connection, the spiritual connection to God is giving with Allah Azza wa Jal. He's telling you something, mind your mind. No arrogance, intellectual humility. The book is one, your readings are multiple. So get this right. This is the starting point of everything. So I'm not coming with, and why I'm saying this is in the university, because very often we don't understand that getting knowledge should help us to worship God in a better way. It's, we are not sh worshiping knowledge. We are using knowledge to worship better. So if we use knowledge to worship better, it means that the starting point of our intellectual journey is a spiritual mindset, is a spiritual stand. I don't get it all right. I'm trying my best to come close to the truth. And there are other ways coming from other Muslims and other traditions. That's the starting point of our discussion here, which is very important spiritually, intellectually, socially, and even internationally, and politically, as you can see the consequences of that today. ارز کنم که برخلاف با یک ثانی و مثل هم بودن جمع نمیشه و مستلزم آزادی اندیشه هست نکته عمیقی که هست بحث طرز فکر هست که از فهم معنوی شکل میگیره از اینکه فقط یک خدا و وقتانیت خدا تأثیر میگیره و فقط یک نکته روان شناختی نیست بلکه کاملا یک مفهوم عمیق معنوی است و بنمایه وحدانیت و تفکر اسلامی اینه که رسیدن به درک و فهم وحدانیت خدا به تنهایی به دست نمیاد فهم اسلام و این معنویات هیچ وقت به تنهایی به دست نمیاد و با پذیرش اون تنوع هست برای همین هست که قرآن و خداوند تأکید دارن که ما باید مبازه به طرز فکر و تفکر خودمون باشیم مغرور نشیم خودخواه نباشیم و همسال این ها و اینکه ما یک کتاب داریم اما ق... یک... یک کتاب هست اما قرائت های مختلفی از این کتاب وجود داره نکته دیگه که باید بگم اینه که هر ما توجه نداریم که دانشی که ما کسب میکنیم و استفاده میکنیم باید در خدمت بهبود عبادت ما باشه باید کمک بکنه که ما رشد کنیم و در عبادت, عبادت خداوند بهتر باشیم اگر دانش برای عبادت باشه یک سفر اندیشه ای شکل میگیره و یک طرز تکش ما معنوی خواهد بود برای رسیدن به حقیقت باید این دانش کرد اون وقتی که دانش در خدمت عبادت باشه اون وقت مطالعه ما فعالیت های ما در خدمت رسیدن به حقیقت و هدف ما رسیدن به حقیقت واقعی خواهد بود و به این ترتیب سایر مسلمان سایر سنت و سایر تفکرها رو درک خواهیم کرد I missed the last part about political, international, social and intellectual differences. I said this had an impact on all that. Ah, yeah. خب این این طرز فکر و این نگرش تأثیر داره روی همه وجود که چه اندیشه ای باشه چه سیاسی چه اجتماعی و چه بین المللی باشه تأثیر بذار فرد. So with this spiritual intellectual positioning as a starting point of our discussion. That's, that's important for all of us. And I think that we have to enter within academia with 
the spiritual, psychological, and intellectual uh, frame. It's important. I'm completely opposed to anything which is saying, when you enter academia, you forget about the spiritual, intellectual attitude. I think that this is completely wrong. I'm not mixing religion with reason. I'm saying the way spiritually you deal with your rationality it's a paradigm which is so important in the way you are going to deal with your subject, with your topic itself. And I, I'm, I'm questioning all this you know, uh, way of fracturing your spiritual take with your intellectual endeavor and your intellectual commitment. Having said that now, it's not enough. What we have to add to the discussion is two things coming from our intellectual position. There is something which is after coming after the spiritual positioning and the spiritual intellectual positioning, which is intellectual clarity. Intellectual clarity means we are dealing with diversity. How are we going to deal with diversity? And we have to do two things. The first is what are the levels of diversity and what are the limits of diversity? The limits. Are we going to say that in the name of uh, diversity, everything is possible? When, for example, coming from some in the West saying, you know what, we have to democratize the way we deal with the Quran, that's fine. But uh, Daesh and some of these young people who are following the violent extremists are dealing with a very democratic way of dealing with the scriptural sources. They read in the Quran, maqtuluhum, haytu taqibtumuhum, kill them wherever you find them, so we are doing it. So to democratize is not to be more liberal. This could go towards more arrogance and more dogmatism and violence. So what are the limits? Are the limits yes or no? As Muslims coming from a, a tradition which is a very, very deep tradition, of course there are limits to this diversity. There are things that are acceptable and things that are unacceptable. And we have to be clear on what is acceptable and what is not. If you come and tell me I can kill an innocent guy, a man or a woman, only because he's not a Muslim, or I can kill a Muslim because I consider that he's not a Muslim, and say, no way. That's not Islam. So I have to put limits. And then I also have to deal with the levels of diversity. What are we talking about? Because there are levels. So two things that we have to do in intellectual terms. What are the levels? What are the limits? این موضوعی اندیشه ای مهم هست که باید با یک چارچوب روانشناختی اندیشه ای وارد فضای آکادمی ها شد و فضای علمی وارد شد من نمیخوام که دین و عقل و دین و عقلانیت رو روزا ما دیگه تجمیه کنم و تلفیق کنم تنه تجمیه بکنم آیفا بده باید پارادایم هم سساره The part you were talking about paradigms At the beginning after you said that I'm not going to have the uh, religion and reason together? Yes, it, it means that the, par the paradigm of knowledge, or our epistemology, so to speak, from where and how we get knowledge, uh, is going to be, uh, is not going to differentiate between the spiritual input and the intellectual uh, endeavor. Uh, so, I'm so sorry, I didn't follow that. It was a difficult time. <laughs> it's a difficult one. I'm trying to make it simple. Uh, <laughs> We should not differentiate. No, we should not di di divorce the, the spiritual input and the intellectual construction of our reading. من اینجا اشکان داره عبور میکنم چون میدرسان اشتباه متقل بکنم اما دو تا نکتر رو گفتن که مهم هست توی این موزه گیری اون همینه که باید شفافیت اندیشه ای داشته باشیم این شفافیت ضرورت داره که ما دو نکتر رو توی این بحث تنوع و زیل تنوع داریم این که یک سطوح این تنوع چیست دو محدودیت های این تنوع چیست این دور هم نیستش که ما بگیم تنوع و کلن هیچ قیدی براش نداشته باشیم محدودیت قائل نباشیم و هر کس هر کار خواست بکنه این نگاه دموکراتیک به مثلا برداشت دموکراتیک مبتنی بر قرآن 
به معنای یک نگاه لیبرالی نیست که هر کس هر فعالیتی خواست بکنه نمونهش داعشه که میاد به اسم قرآن شروع میکنه هر کس رو میتونه که سر به برو بکشه و قرارت خودش رو از آیت قرآن داره این منجر به خودخواهی میشه اندیشه علمی آکادمیک در تضاد با اندیشه معنوی نباید در تضاد با اندیشه معنوی Translate was helping. Okay, so maybe you can, you can, you can, we can come back to this when we have questions. If you want me to be more precise or, or, or to be clearer, but I understand it's it, it's it's not. Uh, no, I, uh, it's I not try true. to be as accurate as possible. Yeah. Because of that, I was uh, asking again. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, just to finish that. In the Sunnah, the Sunnah, the Amin, the Sunnah, 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 the بکنم ما یک سری آزادی های مقبول داریم و یک سری مرزیت های مقبول داریم و بعضی, بعضی آزادی ها غیر مقبول هست اینطور نیست که من بیام استناد کنم به قرآن که بگم خب هر نامسلمان رو اجازه دارم بکشم یا هر کسی که من فکر میکنم مسلمان نیست بخوام به قصد برسونم یه همچین اجازه رو اسلام به ما نمیده So let me start with the levels and try to say something about this which is a position of principle and you might agree or not but at least we have to, to at least here we are entering uh, an academic intellectual discussion. You may not agree with what I'm saying, but please you come with arguments and you show me why I'm wrong. Okay, you don't try, I think, I thought, I have the impression, that's not the way we have to discuss. So the first is at the highest level, accepting within our history that they are today Sunni, Shi'i, and Ibadi, that are all Muslims. It's a starting point. The people that are coming from my tradition, the Sunni, are the literalists, for example, saying that the Shia are not Muslims and they are even more dangerous than the Muslims are people that I don't accept the position of principle. Sunni, Shia, Ibadi are Muslims and brothers and sisters in Islam. That's the starting point at the highest level dealing with our history, not only in political terms, it's in theological and philosophical and legal terms that we are talking here, because the starting point might have been the political decision, who is going to succeed the prophet, peace be upon him, but then we have theological differences and legal understanding that are different, even with our sources, even if you come to the very essence of usul al fiqh the fundamentals of Islamic law and jurisprudence, we don't have the same sources in the two traditions. We don't deal with them. Even we don't agree who, who was the first, Ja'far al-Sadiq in the Shia tradition, or al-Shafi'i in the Sunni tradition. We don't, we don't agree on who was the first, but at least we accept something which is the starting point. All our Muslims and the starting point of our intellectual journey is you know what, I might not agree with you on many things, but you have no right to tell me I'm less Muslim than you. That's the story. Well, let's talk about the topic of the topic. The topic that I can agree with you, or I can agree with you, is that you are not a topic of the topic. If you are not a topic of the topic, I would like to ask you to ask yourself and ask yourself to ask yourself. بالاترین سطح اینه که ما در بافت تاریخی ما اهل سنت، اهل شیعی و اهل عبادی رو داریم و کسانی که این دستبندی رو نپذیرند و اینها رو جز مسلمان ها تلقی نکنند خودشون تفکر خطرناکتری هستند و خطرات بیشتری بر جامعه اسلامی دارند این جا که این تأثیر این پذیرش این سه دستبندی تأثیرات بیشتری توی بحث سیاسی حقوقی و اندیشه هم خواهد داشت I'm <laughs> 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 بخش نهایی 
It's okay, I think. What the translation is okay, no? Okay, no, we, you know what? I go with diversity and freedom and sometimes with rules, so the rules was that you have to translate. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, just for the 20%, we just go. It seems to be a revolutionary audience here. You want to change the rules. But the point is that we have the tribe, so we can do it. بحث جانشنی پیانبر هم بحث تفاوت الهیاتی پیش آن و این منجر بحث تفاوت به اصول فقه شد و حتی ما منابع فقهیمون و هم تفاوت میکنه با هم دیگه یک زمان این که حالا اول امام جرفر بحث شیعه رو انداخت یا شافعی بحث سنت رو انداخت شاید این اصلا بحث دوستی نماشه مهم نیست که تا یک زمان اینها به هر حال همه مسلمون هم از یک جایی دو تا روی کرد اهل سنت و اهل تشیع شکل گرفته نکته اینه که هر نداریم همدیگه رو متهم بکنیم که کمتر از همدیگه مسلمون هستیم من به عنوان اهل سنت بگم که شما کمتر از من مسلمون هستید یا شما به من به عنوان یک سنی بگید که من کمتر از شما مسلمون هستم سو دیس از دی هایست لول اند دن کمز سمثینگ دت وی هاو این بوث Uh, or even in the three traditions, and it's quite interesting that uh, the Ibadi are one percent, and sometimes we forget them. It's as if we are just dealing between uh, Sunni and Shia. It's important. One percent. It's important in Oman or in Zanzibar. This is also a very interesting legal production coming from Ibadi uh, uh, ulama. But within our tradition, let us come to the first level within our tradition, which is coming from the first Islamic science in history, which was the legal, what we call in, in Arabic fiqh, Islamic law and jurisprudence, and get it right, I'm not translating fiqh into jurisprudence, it's law and jurisprudence, it's both at the same time. Uh, so here we have differences in our tradition, it's quite interesting to remember that the sixth imam in the Shia tradition was the teachers of two of the main uh, Sunni scholars, Uh, that we had, so the connection between the two were not as we are now thinking that were completely different. Uh, uh, and then what we had in the, uh, the, 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 the Shia tradition coming at the highest level, the 12 verse, Isna Ashariya, uh, which is now uh, through the Ja'afari, uh, is the, the mainstream reference that you have. You have others that it's disputed, are they within, how much they are outside the seminars and, and the Yiri and all the others. In the Islamic Sunni tradition, you have also schools of law that are different. You all know about this when it comes to, so I'm not going to repeat uh, what you know, but uh, the Al-Malikiyya, Al-Hanafiyya, Al-Shafi'iyya, Al-Hanbaliyya, Al-Zaydiyya, these are schools of law. They all accepted one thing, that we have different legal schools of uh, uh, law, but we're all Muslims, and they were not agreeing on fundamental questions when it comes to the legal. 
And you also have this in the way, uh, for example, between al Akbari, al Usuli, al Sheikhi. In the Shia tradition, you also have different perceptions and understandings and the way you deal with the scriptural sources, in the way, for example, the text has. Uh, precedence over the, 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 the rationality and how much room for interpretation you have. And this is the big discussion between Al Akbari and Al Usuli in your tradition. So these are legal differences that we all accept in our respective tradition in the Shiai, in the Sunni, and in the Ibadi tradition. So this is the second level. In our chronology, it's important to get this because from the very beginning, no Alim. It came from the followers, but no alim there to say, you are the alim, you are no longer a Muslim. You are not a Muslim because you don't have the same legal framework. Yes, I'm right, but I also might be wrong. And you, I think it's wrong, but you also, this was the Shafi'i positioning that we had, that we find in the Shia tradition from the very beginning. We had exactly the same positioning when it came to this legal diversity within. Legal law, you mean yeah. uh, so uh, I mean, 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 اما سطح بعدی اینه که اولین علم اسلامی که شکل گرفت فقه هست که حالا هم لو ان جوش پرودنسی شو میگه توی بحث چیز حالا فقه مشخصه برای ما تو فارسی یک نکته هست اینه که دو تا از علمای اهل سنت که خیلی ها فکر میکنن کاملا اهل سنت و اهل تشیع اختلاف دارن و از هم دیگه جدا هستن اینطور نیست دو تا از علمای اهل سنت شاگردان شش امام بودن و امام شیشان بودن اوش کنی کنم من اینجا عدد نمیشته بودن شاگرده امام شیشان بودن و این ارتباط بین اینها وجود داشت و مجزده نبودن به هر حال چه اهل تشعیه و چه اهل سنت اختلاف های توی قرارت های خودشون ممکنه داشته باشن چه اصل اشری و جرفری که اصلی از مطلب اصلی تشعیه و حساب میشه به هر حال زیل این هم ما گروه های دیگه ای داریم که ممکن محل بحث هستن ممکنه پذیرفته بشن یا نشن تو اهل سنت هم همینطور هستن من خود فقه مختلفی داریم بحث همبدی و شافعی و گروه های فکری متفاوت رو داریم اما بحث اشتراک همه اینا اینه که فقه اسلامی رو دارن سوال اصلی اینجاست که این فرضیات متفاوتی اینها دارن و از این فرضیات ممکنه به روی کرده مختلف برسن فرقی که بین اخباریان و اصولی مثلا هستش این که بعضی این که اولویت با متن هست با متن قرآن هست یا روایات هست یا اولویت با عقلانی هست کدوم رو ابتدا قرار بدیم و پاسخ ما متفاوت خواهد شد اما نکته اینجاست که باید بپذیریم این تفاوت رو توی این سطح دوم سطح دوم اینجاست که این پس این تفاوت رو توی این علم فقه بپذیریم و هیچ عالمی جرأت نمی‌کنه بیاد بگه که فقط من درست هستم و دیگران اشتباه هستن so this is the second level and there is a third level in our chronology which is also very important because it has an impact in the way we think today and the way we are going to deal with sciences per se is as you know in our history usul al fiqh the fundamentals of islamic law and jurisprudence came after fiqh which is the applied uh, uh, legal framework. He came afterward asking which question? What was the main question? What are the sources of your knowledge? From where do you get the knowledge? And you have coming from the Jafari tradition, and this is why in the Shi'i tradition say it came from the Shi'i Shi tradition, and some are saying it came from the Sunni. The point is not so important. We had exactly the same fundamental questions. When it comes to knowledge, are you relying only on texts, on reason, or on something else? What are the sources of your knowledge? A big question, a fundamental question. If you say it's only the texts, 
as you know, in the, for example, in the Akhbari uh, tradition, but also in our tradition, what we call it Ash'ariya, saying the only thing that is the reference for us is the text. The text should be the reference. So what could your aql produce? Which, in fact, in the Shia tradition, this was much more powerful than in the Sunni tradition, integrating al aql into it as a source, which is not in the mainstream in uh, uh, the Sunni tradition. It's not al aql as being a source of knowledge. But you know, this is a very deep question. If you say al aql could be a source of knowledge, it means inductively that any type of knowledge that you get from your aql could be part of the source producing an ego. That's an essential discussion that we still have now. Why? Because today, what do you do with all the sciences when it comes to economics, when it comes to social sciences, when it comes to experimental sciences, when the apple is getting the knowledge from the environment, do we take this as a potential source of legal production, yes or no? The Shia tradition is responding faster than the Sunni tradition, yes. The Sunni tradition has a problem this, in, in this discussion, and you know the tensions between the Mu'tazila and al Ash'ariya and al Maturidiya. These were discussions that we had with it, but this is something which is important. Why? As much as I have to accept somebody telling me I take only what is in the Quran as a source of knowledge, I also have to say. I also respect somebody saying the text is the reference, the ultimate reference, but my mind is also a reference. And when I say my mind, I'm also saying what my mind is getting from the environment, the creation, all the sciences could be part of the production of the legal understanding in Islam. That's a very deep discussion that we have now. You know why? Because in the way we are dealing with our tradition, and the way we are dealing with the universal production of knowledge of humanity, you are much more open when you say the intelligence. My mind is a source of knowledge. And you don't take the text versus other sciences. That's very important. Is the, you, you can understand here at that level we have a deep discussion. Let me add one dimension which is important. And especially in the, the Iranian tradition, when you travel around here, and I saw this over the two days, and, and unfortunately it's only the first time I'm visiting Iran, uh, my mistake. But it's something which it's a very important thing. And look at the way it's connected to what I said at the beginning that uh, there is a very deep tradition in uh, uh, the Shia tradition, in the Sunni tradition, which is there is another source of knowledge. And it's key. It's not my mind. It's not the text. It's my heart. They have hearts. They don't understand. Deep understanding. Meaning that sometimes, you will look at the book, read the book, it's only your heart that is going to get the message. But not only this. You look at the universe, and it's only through your heart that you will see the signs that he's sending to your heart that your, own, your mind don't get, doesn't get. Meaning, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ We will show them our signs in the horizon. The horizon is in the creation. So you don't come to the world only with your mind. You come to the world with your heart, which is a source of knowledge. Who said that as something which was critical? The mystical tradition, the Sufi tradition. And there is nothing wrong in the tasawwuf as what was said by the literalist and the dogmatic saying, Sufism is coming from outside Islam. That's not true. The true Sufism is coming from the very heart of Islam. What is the folkloric Sufis? It's something else. I'm not talking about this. The people who are flying 24-7. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the serious Sufi tradition, saying how much the heart and the mind and the text are source of knowledge. And we don't agree on this. We don't agree. You have people saying the text first, and that's it. Others saying, my mind, why? Because my mind will never be against the text because God cannot give me a mind against what he's revealing. 
and others say, but add to the, your mind the fact that your heart is also going to get uh, some knowledge. And you know, it's, it's, this is something which is deep. When, for example, some people will say, you know what, I will never start reading the Quran or reading the world without doing my ablution. You think that your ablution is only for the cleanliness of your body? No. It's about purifying your heart. It's the way you enter in communication with God and with the universe. It's deeper than that. So these are the, this is the third level of our diversity. Um, 
عرض کردم گفتم فیل گیست خب عرض کردم چیز که روز بعضی فرقه ها و سنتی ها توی صوفیگری حالا درست در جامعه خوب نیست ولی اگه ندونم میپرسم صوفیگری رو فهم بودم که اگه بعضی جاها مثل مثلا حالا اسم نیمه بعضی جاها صوفیگریشون صرفا در مراسم و بعضی رفتارها و رقص و اینجور چیز هاست این رو گفتم پذیرفته نیست ولی اون صوفیگری اندیشه ای که بخص فهم دلی و عرفانی هست رو تایید کردن ایشون رو عرض کردم چه سوال Okay, so as I don't have much time and, and I want to give you some time for questions and, and answers, let me just try to uh, summarize the, the second part of my talk, but just to, rem to remind you. First, the first level is the three main traditions, and then schools of law, and then schools of thought, but not, that's not enough. We have a third level, and the third level uh, has to do with trends and currents within the Islamic tradition. So I'm saying this because we are in an academic setting and we are supposed to have thinkers and students and, and professors and very often when it comes to explain to ourselves and to people our own diversity we are lost, it's not structured in our mind, yes, we, and we, 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 div we confuse this very structured diversity into divisions and we don't know what we are talking about. So here I'm talking about the levels. And when it comes to, for example, trends, we have traditionalists, we have literalists, we have reformists, we have uh, uh, rationalists, and we have uh, Sufi. These trends are on the ground. Come in Iran and look at the people. You have traditionalists, and you have literalists. The way they are reading the scriptural sources is very literal. And you have reformists. They, have, they are thinking about how am I going to review my understanding of the text in the light of the contemporary challenges? And you have leading scholars in the reformist tradition in Iran and in the region, and in, you have exactly the same in the Sunni tradition and the same in the Ibadi. We are dealing, I myself, I cons I'm considered by some, sometimes literalist, as outside Islam because of the reformist thinking that I'm trying to bring about, which part, it's part for me of, there is no faithfulness to a tradition without evolution of thought. That's my position. No faithfulness to the source without evolving with your thoughts, because the world is moving and the questions are new. But we also have rationalists, and we have Sufi, all of us. We are dealing with trends. So this also is the fourth level of our diversity. And my conclusion as to what are the levels here is once again to come with the introduction that I uh, started with is it's important for us to be quite clear, to have some clarity with this because it helps us to be open in a structured way towards our brothers and sisters from other tradition, understanding the levels and then my conclusion will be about what are the limits. Uh, thank you for the 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 روش فکر نکنیم و ادبیاتی برایش تولید نکردیم که بتونیم برای یک نفر مثلا بیرون از اسلامی و کسی که داره در مورد این تنوع مکاتب فکری اسلامی میپرسه بتونیم به راحتی توضیح بدیم و ممکن حتی گیج بشیم این در مورد جریان ها ما جریان های مختلفی داریم سنتی هستند اسلام طلب اسلامگران هستند اولین هستند کسی که وفاده به مت هستند وجود دارند و سوپیان هم وجود دارند و همه اینا رو تو فرقه های مختلف هم میبینیم چه تو اهل تسنن چه تو اهل تشیع و گاهی شده که از یک منظر به من نگاه کردم و من رو خارج از اسلام با نگاه خودشون دیدم ولی من باید نیستم که حتما لزومی داره که ما وفادار به یکی از اینا حتما باشیم مگه چون مهم تکامل اندیشه ماست که باید شکل بگیره پس ما برای اینکه جمعندی بکنم این سطوح رو برمیگردم به اون مقدمه اول که خیلی نکته مهمی است و این هم اینکه شفافیت داشته باشیم که ما در ساختار باید همدیگه رو بپذیریم و پذیرای همدیگه باشیم و بعد برای جمعندی So about the, the, the limits uh, Once again, here there are also levels 
and understanding some priorities. The first is in the three main traditions in the uh, 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 Sunni, al uh, uh, Shi'i, and, and the Ibadi tradition, is they are fundamentals that are defining what we are uh, understanding as being Islamic. So, when it comes, for example, to the creed, al Aqidah, or when it comes, for example, to al Ibadat, our uh, practice, the, the obligations, what we have to do, and we sh what we should not do, which are the prohibitions, we agree here that there are things that are clear-cut in our tradition. No one is going to come and say, you know what, in the name of my understanding, I'm not going to fast Ramadan. I'm not going to, uh, no. Do we have principles here that are part of the creed and that are part of uh, the fundamentals in all the tradition? So here, there is something which is we may disagree on the fact that you pray five times in three times and I pray five times in five times. We do agree that there are five prayers a day. So in this, we agree. Within this, there, are, there is a diversity of implementation, but the principles are clear. And you can say there is only one God and uh, you cannot just accept anything which has to do with shirk, which is... I'm going to talk to somebody to do it for me uh, on behalf of God, which is shirk. This is something that we cannot accept. Our monotheistic tradition is clear on the principles of our common aqidah, which is la ilaha illahu. So they are here at that level, clear limits to, okay, if you say, for example, that there is a prophet after the prophet, I say, okay, and it happened to me with some of the, the uh, Ahmadiyya. I said, okay, you think that there is a prophet after the prophet, and you call yourself a Muslim. I think that there is a limit here. So I enter with you into an interface dialogue, not an intra-community dialogue, because there is a limit about having or thinking that there is a prophet after the prophet. For us, there is a limit here. It doesn't mean that I'm going to kill you, but I'm going to enter into the quality of our dialogue, which is interfaith dialogue. This is something which is not part of the essential in the three traditions. So we have to be clear about the fundamentals here. At that level, there are limits in the way we define Islam. If not, everything is possible. مبانی و مبانی یکسانه و طریق اسم بودن شاید یکسان باشه که اون ستا تنقیه کلی ما در مورد اینکه که چارچوب های وجوب و حرمت به حال وجود دارن و اصول اولیه رو با هم دیگه توافق داریم و مورد توافق هم همه هست منطقه در نحوه اجرا ممکنه توافق اختلافی داشته باشیم به حال قبول داریم که باید نماز بخونیم حالا یک فرقه پنج بار در روز میخونه یک فرقه سه بار در روز میخونه ولی به هر حال در کلیت این عبادت و نماز خوندن اختلاف نیست در مورد روزه گرفتن همینطور به هر حال قبول داریم که باید روزه بگیریم توی ایام ما رمضان کس نمیاد بگه که خب من روزه رو نمیگیرم قائل نیستم بهش همه قبول داریم ولی ممکنه توی جزئیات اجرایی کردنش و در اجرا تنوع داشته باشیم همه ما یک خدا میپرستیم و وحدت مورد اشتراک ماست این وجهش وجوه اشتراک ماست اما اگه یکی بیاد بگه مثلا مثل احمدیه زارن که بعد از پیامبر اسلام پیامبر دیگری اومده اگر چنین چیزی باشه این دیگه تو دایره دین ما نیست دیگه گفتگوی ما با اینها نه اینکه باشون گفتگو نکنیم و بخوایم اینها رو بکشیم یا مثلا باشون برخورد بکنیم گفتگوی ما با اینها دیگه گفتگوی درون دینی نیست گفتگوی بین ادیان خواهد بود ما اون رو یک دینی غیر از اسلام تلقی میکنیم چون یکی از اصول رو زیر پا گذاشته که بعد از پیامبر اسلام یک پیامبر دیگری قائل شده وقتی این رو قائل شد دیگه پس نگاه اسلامی نیست پس دین ما نیست پس دیگه درون دینی باهاش گفتگو نمیکنیم بلکه گفتگوی بین دو تا ادیان خواهد دو تا دین خواهد بود the second level which is also important when in our our uh, the limits which is also important and we have to be clear it everything which has to, and sometimes it's subtle is everything which has to do with superstition superstition which is for example, to go as far as to think or to rely on the power except the only power of the only one God. 
So that's important because sometimes it's subtle and sometimes you are not clear on this. Many scholars accepted, for example, that you can rely on a murabbi, which is a, who is a teacher. That you are, for example, uh, asking somebody who can help you towards your spiritual journey. That's not a problem. But there is one point. One point. No way that you can accept this. You worship only him. You do not worship a human being. So anything which has to do with worshipping a scholar or worshipping a human being, even the Prophet, peace be upon him, and it's in the Qur'an, we don't worship Muhammad, we worship only God. So in any Sufi tradition, in any setting where you end up worshipping a human being and saying, this is the way I'm worshipping God, this is superstition and this is shirk. So at that level, then there are limits in the way that, for example, in the way you have to deal with the scholars. So you be very respectful of your scholars, and you have to be respectful, but with one thing. You don't avoid thinking when they think on your behalf. There is no scholar thinking on your behalf. No way. You cannot say, you know what, like Goebbels said about Hitler, I had no conscience. He was my conscience. In Islam, no way. You're not going to go in front of, uh, before Allah, as the Wajal say, you know what, I did it because he told me. You can't do that. وَكُلُّهُمْ آتِهِمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْضًا You are going to be alone before God. You have to respond to the question. What have you done with your intelligence? What have you done with your consciousness? So you cannot just say, oh, I was worshipping so-and-so. No way. So anything which has to do with superstition, adding to this, taking from the culture, and you are in danger of this in Iran, as we are in Muslim majority countries in the Arab world or in African countries. Anything which is coming from the culture added to Islam and ending up towards superstition. That's no way for us. We have to put some limits here. So we have the second level. Uh, superstition, what is <laughs> 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 اینکه مثلا قائد قدرتی غیر از قدرت واحد خدا بشیم نکته ظریفی است که شاید به راحتی قابل کش نباشه ولی این جزء خرافات است به عنوان مثال اگر برای یه سفر معنوی یا رشد معنوی مربی داشته باشیم نباید اون مربی نیست که داریم دنبال میکنیم و ازش تبعیت میکنیم و به اصطلاح میپرستیمش بلکه خود خدا هست که ما از طریق این مربی داریم بهش پرستش میکنیم حتی خود پیامبر رو هم قرآن میگه که شخص پیامبر رو نمیپرستیم از طریق پیامبر داریم خدا رو میپرستیم توی توی تفکر صوفی هم اگر عبادت مجرد عبادت فرد بشه باز خرافات و غلط هست بلکه باید از طریق اون مربی اون شیخ یا اون استاد اهل صوفی باید به عبادت خدا رسید و جایگزینی برای تفکر خودمون نداریم اگر اون مربی برای ما فکر میکنه این معنیش نیستش که به جای ما فکر میکنه ما به هر حال باید تفکر خودمون رو داشته باشیم چون در پیشگاه خداوند هم پذیرفته نیست که بگیم خب من این کار کردم که چون این شخص به من گفت باید پاسخگوی رفتار خودمون به عمل کرده خودمون باشیم تحدیدی که توی ایران و جامعه که اکثریت مسلمون هستن جامعه عربی و اینها وجود داره بحث افزوده هایی است که فرهنگ به دین میاره چیزهایی که از فرهنگ وارد دین میشه و so there are two other levels, I just want to put them together because we don't have time, but uh, there is one, one level which is very important in our daily life, is who do you consider to be a Muslim and who you consider to be outside Islam? So that's important why, because today what we are dealing with are people and friends who take the responsibility and give to themselves the power to say you are no longer a Muslim. The Takfiri movement, which is a very old Kharij uh, at the beginning, but we had this in all our history. People deciding that you are no longer a Muslim by deciding that who is a Muslim and who is not. So if I'm saying I'm a Muslim, and in my creed and in my the way I'm dealing with the fundamentals, I acknowledge the fundamentals. But I have a political position which is not the same as you. You have no right to put me outside Islam. So the takfiri based on political positionings or on things that are uh, 
putting people within Islam or outside Islam is not acceptable. We have to be clear on this because what we have, and by the way, the takfiri are not, are not only people coming from Daesh and Boko Haram, and they are takfiri, and we had even in Egypt. But when, for example, the Salafi, the literalist Salafi coming from, and I know that you like what I'm going to say. I know that. But I'm also paying the price of saying this. But the literalists coming from uh, the, the Saudi and the, what we call today Wahhabi, which is in fact the Salafi trend, literalists, putting people within and outside Islam, that's a problem. And, and you have people saying, you know what, we are al firqatun Najiya. We are the saved group. And all of you we are going to be lost. First of them being the Shia and all, so many people in Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah are outside. So this is unacceptable. No one has the right to decide that this is the only safe group and putting all the other people from within the Islamic tradition in hell fire saying we are saved. So this is also, it means that we have the courage to say your position is in fact reducing and betraying the very essence of what Islam is all about. Islam is accepted, this diversity, and you are not. So you are reducing it. And uh, the last thing that I wanted to add as a fourth level of diversity is something which is also important, that in Islam, we have one text and a prophetic tradition, but our unity here is based also on a diversity of cultures. So you have the Iranian cultures, you have the Arab cultures, and you have the Western cultures. We have to be very clear on this. What is unaccepted is when your culture take over on the texts. So for example, in the name of the patriarchal culture, you make the text say something that the text doesn't say. So one of the main examples here is has to do with women. That we have in many Muslim majority countries something which has nothing to do with the text, but it's a cultural projection. So when, for example, you come to me and say, you know what, you women, you are not going to vote, or you're not going to drive, or you're not going to have your social independence, and you're not to be visible in society, that's not in the text, that's in your culture. So that's not acceptable. So this is why we have to be courageous enough to face our culture. And I would say for Iranian people, it's not enough to say that Iran is a Muslim majority country. It's how much you are ready, in the name of the Islamic principles, to deal with the Iranian culture in a critical way by saying this is cultural, that's not Islamic. That's a very important point here, which is what are the limits of the acceptance of cultures when cultures are dealing against principles. And we have so many cases where uh, we have to deal with this. So add to the cultural side something which also is uh, unacceptable is take it as it is. I come here, I'm a Sunni, the great majority of you are Shia, uh, and that's the reality of our world. We are going to have political, different political opinions. And in the last two days that I've been here, and actually even before, we don't agree on, on Syria, don't we? We don't. We don't agree on many issues in the Middle East. We don't agree in the way we look at the West. And I will challenge anyone here in this room who is going to tell me the West is bad per se. And so I'm sorry you are insulting me. I'm a Western Muslim. Get that? So the West is not bad per se. I'm there. OK? So the West is not bad per se, and Iran is not good per se. Our political position, and it's unacceptable to go from political differences and divergences to sectarianism in religious terms. That's not acceptable. So we need to deal with this, even between yourself. There is no political position which is more Islamic per se than another. These are interpretations, understandings. It might be that you have a specific understanding of the Middle East that I don't have. Be careful not to start takfiri positioning in the name of political position. That's unacceptable. Unacceptable. Saying, I'm not going to accept anyone who has a different political position in putting me outside of Islam because he or she thinks that the only right Islamic position is the one decided by, not that's a political position. 
And even in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the, the, the companions disagreed on strategies. Strategies are what? Political translation of a political view. So how come they decided you are Muslim, you are not? You can do that. So this is an, an accepted way of dealing with our diversity. I'm sorry, it's a long one. And then I promise it's just no, no, a minute's complete. No, that's not good. Actually, um, دو تا سطح بعد رو یک جا میگم که وقتم خلاصه بشه سطح سوم که مهم است اینه که تعریف ما از مسلمان و غیر مسلمان چیه اینکه چه کسی مسلمان و چه کسی مسلمان نیست نکته مهمی است که جزء محدودیت هاست وقتی این مسئولیت رو برای خودشون قائلن که همچین چیزی رو تعریف بکنن که مثل تفکر تکفیری است که معتقدم هر کس که مثل ما فکر میکنه مسلمان غیر از ما کلا مسلمان نیست این رو تو تفکر سلفی و وهابی هم داریم که این تفکر مقبول نیست که میگن ما گروه نجات یافته و گروه درست هستیم فقط ما به حقیم و هر کس غیر از ما فکر میکنه مطلقا جهنمی است و غیر مقبوله این باعث تقلید اسلام و خیانت به اساس اسلام خواهد بود نکته چهارم و سطح چهارم توی محدودیت ها اینه که باید مراقب باشیم که توی تنوع فرهنگی که توی جوامع اسلامی هست بر متن غلبه پیدا نکنه یعنی اینکه ما نیام به خاطر متن آموزهای فرهنگی و روی کرده فرهنگی رو اولویت بدیم و تلاش کنیم از توی متن قرآن چیزی در تایید روی کرده فرهنگی خودمون پیدا بکنیم چیزی که در مورد مثلا رأی رانندگی یا موقعیت اجتماعی زنان تو بعضی جوامع می‌بینیم که از فرهنگشون ولی اون نسبت به اسلام نسبت میدن که اسلام اجازه نداده که زن رانندگی کنه یا رأی بده یا توی جامعه حضور فعال نداشته باشه این قابل پذیرفتن قابل پذیرش نیست و حق نداریم که متن رو در اولویت دوم قرار بدیم و فرهنگ به متن غلبه بکنه و ما باید انقدر شجاعت داشته باشیم که موارد فرهنگی و نکتهایی که تو فرهنگمون مخالف اسلام هست تضاد رو و اسلام داره در مقابلش بیستیم و به چالش بکشیم اونها رو بحث دیگه اینه که به هر حال همه نظرات سیاسی مختلف دارن ما الان در مورد سوریه اختلاف نظر داریم فکر میکنم در مورد غرب ممکنه اختلاف نظر داشته باشه اگر بیاد بگید که غرب فی نفسه بده من مخالفت میکنم و میگم خب من غرب هستم به من توهین میکنی کما که ایران فی نفسه کاملا خوب نیست اینها نظرات سیاسی مختلف ولی این نظرات که قابل پذیرش به هر حال که ممکن نظر سیاسی خودش رو داشته باشه منتهی این اختلاف سیاسی نباید به فرقه گرایی منجر بشه نباید باعث اختلاف بین فرق اسلامی در ساعت اندیشه ای بشه و همدیگه رو تکفیر بکنیم چون مخالف نگاه سیاسی من نگاه میکنی پس مسلمان نیستی هیچ رویکرد سیاسی توی نگاه اسلامی اسلامی تر از بقیه نیست این نیستش که ما روی کرده سیاسی ما اختلاف نظر سیاسی ما سطح اسلام ما رو بخواد جا به جا بکنه So you can understand that the way I'm trying to classify the levels of uh, diversity and uh, the spectrum of this accepted uh, diversity and what are the limits the last one, the fifth level of this uh, 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 when it comes to limits has to do with not only how do we deal with our brothers and sisters within, who is a Muslim and who is not, is, okay, now that we are dealing with people who are not Muslims, who are people of other faith, and by the way, I'm trying to avoid in the way I talk to, about Christians and Jews and, and, uh, and Buddhists, the, 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 the way we are very often talking about them by saying non-Muslims. I wouldn't like being defined as non-Christians. I think that we have to deal with people by naming them the way they name themselves. So they are Christians and they are Jews and they are atheists. We should not look at the world as versus Muslims, is non-Muslims. No, we have to be very cautious with our terminology and it's out of respect. If Allah is saying that this diversity is his will, we have to be very cautious. The point here is once we say, oh, this is kuf, meaning rejecting the truth, or this is not Islamic, is the way you are going to deal and what are the limits uh, when it comes to uh, even conflicts. In Islam, there is an ethics of war. There are things that we cannot do. So for example, to be, this clarity means that anything which is done today by Boko Haram, Daesh, what is the so-called ISIL, this is against the Islamic principles. That's not acceptable. 
the way they define themselves, the way they define the state, the way they define the Muslims, and the way they define the people of other faiths, and they say, by the very meaning and understanding of the Quran, I can kill you because you are not a Muslim, or you are supporting politically other forces, we have to be clear, this is not our religion. I didn't say, be careful, I didn't say it has nothing to do with Islam, and I didn't say they are not Muslims. I don't think that we have the right to say this. People who are saying we are Muslims, we cannot just say, oh, you are not Muslims, and this has nothing to do with Islam. Of course, the guys are quoting the Quran, so you have to respond by saying, the way you use the Quran is an unaccepted way, and this is not part of the accepted diversity. So we have to take this seriously. It's a very serious matter that we have to be clear. And when it comes to, they say about you that you are not Muslims, you don't say about them that they are not Muslims. They are Muslims, but they are not behaving in the light of what Islam is. So I think that we have very to be very clear here. And whatever is your take on manipulation and who is behind, I don't care about it. I, like you, and like many even in the West, think that there are things that are not known about who are these people and who, are, who is supporting them. And I take a position of what I know. When, for example, in September uh, 11 in the United States of America, people were saying, who is behind? Say, I don't care who is behind. I take a position on what I know. What they did is completely unacceptable and should be condemned. Now I have questions. Who, how, does, I have natural questions and we need to get with our questions, not to be naive in the way we deal with the issue, but we should take a clear position on what we know and stop this paranoia that because we don't know, we are not clear on our position. Having said that, and this is my conclusion, all what I said here, starting with this spiritual and psychological mindset that I was saying, I was referring to, I think that when it comes to this typology, it requires from all of us this clear understanding of this accepted diversity the levels of diversity and the, the, the spectrum of the limits. That's a very important point. It helps us to start with a spiritual, intellectual journey based on intellectual humility. This intellectual humility goes with something which I always repeat, courage. We need to face our own community because in your community in Iran, and in many ways, and I've, I'm experiencing this day in, day out, we have people who are very nice when they are sitting, but in the way they deal within the community is very dogmatic. We are under the threat, the threat of dogmatism. Dogmatism is to look at things from our viewpoint and not being able to deal with this diversity. Can I ask you something during the last months? You, Shia Muslims or Sunni Muslims or whoever you are in this, in this room, you are very happy with the fact that we are opening a discussion about typology. How many people of other trends have you met over the last months challenging your positions in Islam? How many? How many people are you dealing with in your daily life to be able to tell me now that you are not going to an intellectual nice journey but a uh, very difficult implementation of what I'm saying. How many people are you meeting that are coming with other views, other understandings, politically, religiously, coming from within your own tradition or not? Are you dealing with diversity or are you talking about diversity? I'm not going to, I'm not coming here in this university to talk about diversity. I'm talking about how much are you dealing with it in your daily life. That's the point. That's what we need now. How many mosques are you visiting that are not your mosque, you people? Because I'm always repeating, it's very, very, very easy to be open-minded in a very close circle. Okay, I'm very open-minded, but that's with my people. And my people are always more brothers and sisters than the others. Even though we say, So that's the reality that I can see even in your country, that I can see in my country of origin, in Egypt, that I can see in my community that I can see among Sunni, that I can see among Shia, is that we are in danger, and let me put it clear, the last point is, whatever you say about, uh, 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 what you say about uh, uh, the West, and what you say about uh, the other, the, the forces that are against Islam, 
the first to behave against the Islamic principles are not the United States of America and the European countries. These are the Muslims themselves. It's us that we have a problem with our own tradition. And let me also add something that I, wanted, I don't want to miss here, is when I was talking about violence, and when I was talking about uh, uh, the rules, the ethics of war, we also have to be clear that as much as what is done by Daesh and all these people killing innocent is wrong, we also have to be clear. There is a difference between unlegitimate use of violence and legitimate resistance. So anyone who is coming to me, and this is, you know, I was back from the state for two things. I said it just after Colin Powell started to explain to us that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I say, the Iraqi resistance is legitimate, the Palestinian resistance is legitimate. These are not terrorists, these are freedom fighters, and you have to get it right. So I might be against Daesh and ISIL, I'm not going to let you put me in a situation where in the name of my consideration against illegitimate violence, I'm not going to support the legitimate resistance. But to in fact, your illegitimate colonization, your illegitimate support, that has to be clear as well, because some Muslims today in the West, in order to be accepted, they are ready to keep quiet on all the legitimate resistance. They keep quiet. Don't speak about Palestine, don't speak about uh, what is happening in the Middle East, don't speak about this, don't speak about that, just to make Islam acceptable. No, this is not an accepted Islam. This is a compromised Islam. This is no longer the position that I think are uh, put with clarity and courage. Thank you and sorry for this long. کسانی که مسلمان نیستن و غیر مسلمان نده نخونیم باید دقیق داشته باشیم که بگیم باید مسیحیست، بوداییست، یهودیست یا دینش رو بگیم نه که کلا بگیم مسلمان و غیر مسلمان و از این تعبیر شاید تعبیر درستی نباشه این تنوع اگر خاص خداست باید بهش احترام بذاریم و محتاط باشیم در اقبالش بحث دیگه اینه که ما در اسلام حتی در مورد جنگ و تقابل با کفر هم اخلاق جنگ رو داریم اخلاقیات رو داریم کاری که بکو هر مدارش میکنن مخالف اسلامه اما ما نباید بیان بگیم که اینها نامسلمان هستن به هر حال داره قرآن میخونه مدعی است که اسم مسلمانه و داره میگه من مسلمان هستم ما باید بگیم احترام بذاریم بمونه به این حرفش که میگه من مسلمان هستم منتها عملگرد عمل کردش رو نقل میکنه و میگیم که این کاری که داره میکنه این برداشتی که از اسلام داری غیر قابل قبوله و درست نیست و این اشتباهی استفاده غلطه ولی نمیگیم که اونها مسلمان نیستن چون تفاوت ما با اونها همین خواهد بود اگه به ما میگن غیر مسلمان چون خلاف خلاف روی کرده اونها فکر میکنیم خلاف نگاه سیاسی اونها داریم عمل میکنیم ما نباید همون کار رو تکرار بکنیم و ما هم اونها بگیم که مسلمان نیستن باید که باید عمل کرده اونها رو زیر سوال ببنیم و بر اساس اسلام نقل بکنیم در مورد 11 سپتامبر رو همین اتفاق افتاد و در مورد چیزهایی که مطمئن هستیم حرف بزنیم در مورد 11 سپتامبر این که چه اتفاقی افتاد مشخص بود این که چه کسی پشتش بود مشخص نبود قطعی نبود و من هم اون گفتم این کار کار غلطی است حالا هر کسی که انجام داده باشه چه مسلمان چه غیر مسلمان انجام داده باشه این کار که انفجار 11 سپتامبر بود کار غلطی بود بر اساس اسلام در مورد چیزهای دیگه باید همین جور همین رو گفت اینکه داعش چه کسی داره از داعش یا بقیه گروه تروریستی حمایت میکنه مهم نیست و ما نمیدونیم به جای که بیان بر اساس فرضیات و تصورات حرف بزنیم بیان بر اساس محکمات حرف بزنیم و این که میدونیم بر اساس نگاه اسلامی این کاری که داعش و امثال داعش دارن انجام میدن کار غلطی است و پذیرفته نیست این رو میتونیم زیر سوال ببریم نکته دیگه که باید در تقابل با جامعه خودمون باید جرأت داشته باشیم اینکه خیلی از مردم هستن خیلی از ما هستیم که تو ساحت شخصی شاید خیلی آدم روشن فکر و خوبی باشیم ولی در تعامل با جامعه روی کرده دو می داشته باشیم و خیلی دوگماتیک رفتار بکنیم سوالی که از شما آدم که تو این توی یک ماه اخیر با چند نفر آدم متفاوت از روی کرده متفاوت با 
با خودتون تعامل واقعی داشتید نه اینکه صرفا برخورد داشته باشید تعامل کرده باشید با کسایی که حالا چه از لحاظ سیاسی چه از لحاظ فرهنگی چه از لحاظ اعتقادی روی کرده متفاوتی دارن نکته دیگه اینه که توی نگاه قرم و مخالفان اسلام مشکل خود ما هستیم این رو گفتن که ما مشکل خودمون هستیم که باعث اختلاف میشیم نکته ای که هست اینه که ما باید بین مقاومت مشروع و خشونت نامشروع تفاوت قائل بشیم و تصریح کنیم این تفاوت رو داعش خشونت نامشروع داره و این مشخصه اما فعالیت فلسطین یا مبارزان فلسطینی و مبارزان عراقی وقتی که آمریکا حمله کرد به بهانه سلاح های کشتان جمعی این مقاومت مشروع بود چون داشتن از سرزمین خودشون دفاع میکردن غربی ها هم ندارن بیان به اساس همون, طرز همون نگرش من که میگم نباید خوشونت نامش رو وجود داشته باشه بخوان از من انتظار داشته باشن که امثال فلسطینی ها و عراقی ها رو هم زیر سوال ببرن چون این دوتا کاملا از همدیگه مجزاست و باید این اختلاف رو بینشون قائل بود Thank you. Thank you. I think that you can...